spectacular. We're ready ahead of time. Yay! <laughs> well, I assume I just added a slide. Sorry? And we just added a slide. I just, they can see what I'm saying. Ha ha ha. <laughs> look, just look at all this uh, this off mic banter. It's uh, <laughs> and it's being captioned. It's incredible. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and now everybody will know that so I just added a slide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mysterious off-camera captioning person. You're doing a fantastic job for us. Um, so let's make a start, everyone. Uh, this is the second of our three talks today about testing. And our presenter today uh, is uh, from the Washington, D.C. area, heavily involved with Pi Ladies in, uh, in D.C., uh, is the author of O'Reilly's Accessibility Handbook, and today is going to be telling us all about how to do usability testing on the cheap. Please welcome Katie Cunningham. Good crowd. I never know what to expect when I do a non-Python talk at these conferences. Sometimes I get five of my besties sitting in the middle encouraging me, and sometimes I get a nice full room. So this is a good showing. Uh, who am I? I am the um, Director of Technology at Speak Agent. That means I just pretty much do anything that has to do with the computer, because uh, there's only one of me. Um, startup life. I'm also an author. Uh, I wrote the Accessibility Handbook. I also wrote Teach Yourself Python in 24 Hours, and I have a book coming out pretty soon, as soon as we can get done with editing. It's not called Young Coders. We changed the title to Next Gen Coders um, at the suggestion of one of my students. So why this talk? Why am I here talking about usability? Uh, well, usability is important, and we all know this, because we are grouchy nerds. And any time anything is difficult to use, we criticize it. We say, this you know, app is totally unusable. This site is horrible. Um, anybody who's ever tried to like, do their taxes um, via anything online, you'll hear us complain about it. Um, we do care about usability, so we should care about it for our apps. Usability is the thing that can empower or disenfranchise your users. Uh, it can either make them feel like this is an app that makes them feel wonderful and incredible and they can do so much, or they feel like you hate them and that you don't want to get anything done. And if you've ever been stuck with an application with poor usability, you know this feeling of not only like is this hard to use, but obviously someone's out to get me. Um, it can make small things feel big. Um, an app with just a few functions and great usability is often feels much better than an app with tons of functions and no usability. Um, and it also can make big things feel manageable. manageable. Uh, Heroku's one where it's like, that does a lot of things. Heroku's interface does many things. It spins up dinos. You can add databases. You can add all this stuff, like amazing stuff. But it feels manageable. I can put that in front of first-time developers, and they can deploy a site pretty easily, and they can feel like they know what's going on. Another reason why I'm standing up here is because usability is expensive, like actually testing it. Having a UX person on your team can get really expensive. Um, that's the gold Mac. I don't know how well that shows up. But in psychology, my background's actually in psychology. And that was one of the fields that if you're like, well, I want to be a psychology major, but I don't want to starve, you, we went into usability. Because yeah, there, you were getting paid in the high five, low sixes um, digits. And that was the highest for the psych field, and it still really is. Um, even outsourcing it is expensive. If you just bring somebody onto your team for a little bit, um, most usability experts I know are over $100 an hour. And while they're worth every second, sometimes you just don't have the budget. If this is a personal project of yours where you just want to do this, you probably don't have the budget to go out and find a usability person. And they may not even like agree to work on your project. Um, I did have a friend. He had this app. He's like, I just want to get somebody. I have the money for it. And he couldn't find anybody to set aside four hours for him to do some testing because they had better things to do. Um, and I don't blame them. You know, you might have you know a low budget. You might have no budget or you might have no access to the usability person on your team. Twice, I've been at companies where I, the usability person was literally like three cubes down from me, 
and I could not use them for a project because they were already on a bigger project with a bigger budget with more big eyes looking at it. And I had my tiny little thing over here and I just couldn't get you know five minutes of their time to look at it. Also, if you Google Katie Cunningham and usability, um, you will actually find references to a talk I did in 2008 with Ginger Butcher, who was a former colleague of mine at NASA. And it was a great talk. I loved that talk. It was, it, this is a complete redo of that talk because I don't have the slides anymore because I'm really, I suck at like, you know, archiving things. Um, and I loved that talk. I would point people to it. I loved it and I adored it. And it was on Blip TV. And Blip TV deleted it. And it was one of, if anybody is familiar with the scourge of Python videos that went away because Blip TV just deleted them all, the Plone conference from 2008 was completely lost. So in order to have this video again that I can point people to, I'm doing it here at PyCon, where we have a, we're, we have a much more responsible vendor for storing our videos. One caveat, actually a couple caveats. I am not a, U, a UX person. Um, this is not my day job. I'm a developer. I'm a back-end person. Um, you know, I was psych, that's actually what my major was in, but I've been a full, I've been a developer for, you know, 10 years now. So I'm not speaking, you know, if you are a usability person in the office, in the, in the audience, I might misspeak. I might use the wrong term occasionally. Um, most of my knowledge comes from being, um, in the testing with, um, the UX person. I'm also not downplaying UX people. If you can afford to hire a person or train somebody on your team up to have these skills, do so. They are priceless. We have a dedicated UX person on my, in my startup, and it's making a world of difference. I just accept that some of us don't have money, and we need to have some of these skills like in our heads. So usability testing. Um, when do you do testing? You do it constantly. There's this um, idea that you would only ever do it like before you actually like create the app. You just do all your usability testing then and you know make sure everything looks good and then you just build the app and it's usable. And that's sadly not true. That is a great way to have some really great comps um, that you know and an end product that nobody understands. So you have to test constantly. You have to test it when you get the idea. Um, there is some testing you have to do before you ever, you know, write one line of code or open up, you know, one image like editing program. You need to do it before you start the design process, before you start deciding what the look and feel of your site is going to be, before you create a logo for your cool app. You need to do it before you code. You need to do it while you're coding. Um, you also need to do it after 1.0. In short, you have to do it all the time. It is a part of your testing cycle. If you are testing your code, you should be testing your usability. So you're writing unit tests and you're writing Selenium tests and you're writing you know, load tests. This should be a part of that suite that you should have it in the back of your mind. It's going to feel different because there's not as much code involved, but you should be thinking about this. How are we making sure that our application is usable? So let's start at the beginning. You have an idea. It's a cool idea. You think you can make money. You think you can become famous, or maybe you can make the world better. It's an idea you want to develop. So what do you do first? Most of us, if we have an idea like you know, here at PyCon, we will go to the sprints and set our butts down and just start coding. And oh no, 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 wait, I forgot. We'll register the domain first, because like all of us have 20 domains, right? Um, We'll register the domain and we'll sit down and we'll code a bunch and like throw something up and just see how it works. And sometimes that works, but there's a better way. Um, the first thing you should do is talk to your customers. Who is going to be using this app? Because where are your customers? I cannot count the number of times somebody has come to me and says, so I've created this thing. It's for parents and teenagers to do like, you know, do this thing together. And I'm like, okay, how many parents and teenagers have you spoken to? Oh, none, I'm just gonna build it, and they're gonna find it, and it's gonna work great. And I'm like, you have no idea. The first of all, the parents and teenagers together thing is way more problematic than you think. I have a teenager, and it's, you know, it's not as easy as a lot of people think to just, you know, just throw something up and people will use it. Um, so you need to find your customers and know how to find them and know how to communicate them with them. Once you find them, I would not ask this question. I wouldn't say, would you use this? This is a loaded question. Um, first of all, people are polite. And that's something that even if you think, oh, people are jerks, people are actually quite polite. 
because they'll say, oh, sure. Or what you may run into are people that say, oh, um, you know, yeah, I would like, I, if somebody showed me a thing where it's like, oh, okay, you can use this website, you can upload these documents and they sync to all your other computers. And if you take a picture, it'll sync to the cloud and sync to the other things and it's great. And I'm like, yeah, I would totally use that. And I might forget to say, I already do, it's called Dropbox. And a lot of people do this, like, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, I'm not leaving the thing I, I'm using to use yours. No, 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 but it sounds great, you should do that. Um, so it's really a bad question to ask. A good question, do you use something like this? So you can say, okay, this is what this thing is like. Do you use anything similar? Um, and this is a really important question to ask Curly because my company's running into this. We started interviewing teachers and we're like, um, sorry, I had to wave at my session chair. Um, so do you use something like this? Because what happened was we had um, teachers and we're like, we asked the first question, and they're like, oh, I would totally use that. When we switched the question to, do you use something like this, guess what we found? Competitors. And we hadn't found those competitors before because it was just one of those weird things, the search terms we were using, because users will use things weirdly, and suddenly we discovered this whole suite of you know, apps that were doing what we were doing. We're doing it better. Um, but that was, that was eye-opening for all of us, and there was a week of panic. Ask what it doesn't do. What doesn't this do for you? Um, because that's where you can actually make a difference. Um, and everyone's saying, but this is just interviewing and marketing. This is part of usability testing. A lot of it is speaking to human fleshy beings and looking at them and asking questions and by like, taking notes. Because if you can do this face to face, do so. Because you don't want people to think because people are polite. You want that immediate reaction of, you know, that or eagerness or something, because that's tampered down over time. Um, they will just kind of like, you know, they'll um, modify what they say as they talk to you. So you don't want that. You want the immediate reaction, because the gut reaction is what keeps people on your website or sends them away. So the outcomes of this, is your idea unique? You should be able to answer these questions. Is your, is your idea unique? Is it desirable? It can be unique and nobody wants it. Who is your competition? Know who your competition is. Not so you can you know, kill them, but so you can deliver something different. And where are your users and how are you going to communicate with them and how are you going to reach out to them? So now we've answered those questions and it's design time. So at this point, you wanna answer a question, where does everything go? This is one of the most important questions you can answer as you start beginning design. Um, why? Because we're nerds and we're biased. We think we know where everything goes. Of course it would go here. Of course this is the order of everything. This is totally logical. Different groups of people think differently and they organize things differently. Adding a search box does not mean you have good information architecture. So don't assume that you can just slap a you know, search box on there and people can find everything. You need to figure this out first, but it's super easy. You can do card sorting. This is an analog version. There are online versions. I don't like them as much. I like to watch people touching and getting feeling because they feel into it. Like they're like, all oh, right, I'm gonna sort all these cards. On each card, you put a piece of content or an action. So edit profile, change profile name, blog post about clouds, things that would reasonably be on your site. And you want some duplication, like a couple of blog posts, a pro couple of profiles, that kind of stuff. Then you ask them to sort them into piles. So you want about 30 cards. And you sort them into piles. And then you have them label the piles. And that's what you record. And yes, it's going to be manual. But it, it's actually better when they do this by hand. Because you can watch their, them thinking and moving their hands back and forth. And going, I don't know, like how, what cards are they uncertain about? You kind of want to record everything. Um, I actually prefer, these are typed. Um, I prefer handwritten because sometimes you need to add one on the fly. And yeah, that's not super statsy. I would never do that in something I was going to use as like a peer reviewed journal. But this happens with usability when you're trying to discover like what people need to know about your site. Like they may just ask you like, well, what about, you know, how do I create a blog post? And you're like, oh crap, I didn't put that card in there. You don't need everything on your site, but if people keep asking about it, toss it in there. Um, a quick story, um, when I worked at NASA, we were doing a website and they told us, they're like, we're like, how do you want the site organized? And they're like, well, politically, because it's NASA. And we're like, oh crap, because if you study IA, um, political is the worst way to organize a website. 
So we're like, oh God, don't make us do this. So we did the card sort and we put all the information out there. And what was funny is once we were done, it ran down political lines because the different political sections were called Earth, heliophysics, which is study of the sun, astrophysics, and planetary. So we were able to make everybody happy. Users liked it, and the govies liked it. So the scientists were happy they had their own siloed sections, and users could find everything in a logical manner. So the outcomes after this. You want to know what the structure of your site is. Like, do I know how things are going to be structured? What content is hard to categorize that I'm really going to have to think hard about where it fits? And are you missing content or actions um, that people would like to find but don't know where they are? Now it's time to make things pretty. Now, you notice I skipped wireframes. That's because people, when they use wireframes, it's not always good for testing. Um, like, they put it in front of people and like, this looks horrible. And then you slap some color on it. And they're like, this looks great. Good job. It's so weird. Um, you can show it literally in the same usability session. So making it pretty. This is another thing you need to do face to face. You can either do it over Skype, Google Hangouts, that kind of stuff. Um, it's best to have a neutral party present it because you want people to be brutally honest. Um, some of the questions that you can ask, you know, what are your initial thoughts on this design? Does this remind you of anything? Because this is going to be different per party. Like if my parents say, oh, it looks like it's from Microsoft, that's a compliment because they're like, that's very official and like business. If, one, if like a Linux nerd says that and they're your audience, you might want to like put some rounded corners on that um, and put a bird on it. I don't know, but you know, you might want to you might want to change the look. Um, and you would say like, how would you do this task? How would you find this piece of information and see if the IA that you have set up is actually usable? Like they can actually find where the thing is. Um, I want to, you should do this on screen and paper, depending on what you need. Just know that if you do it on screen, it's very natural, um, but it's less portable. Like you have to open up a laptop. You can't just you know show people a person a piece of paper and they say yes or no. But if you do it on paper, reactions are different. I've had people literally go from like I show it on paper and they're like, uh, I don't, I don't know. And then I put it on the screen and they're like, wow, this is really nice. And I'm like, it's the same thing that I showed you five minutes ago. But it happens. Um, it's also a good time, and I hope I have time for a short story. Um, I had a customer who really loved the color purple. And she had, all her walls were purple. She had, you know, a purple leather couch, which that's a thing apparently you can buy. And she wanted the website to be in purple. And we had her in a usability session behind a glass mirror, and a woman came in who is forever known as the wonderful woman with, wonderful woman with braids because she came in and we sat her down and brought up the very purple site. And the woman said, what the hell is this? And we're like, um, it's the website. And she's like, uh, this is no government website I've ever seen because I have been in the government for 30 years and this is horrible. I can't believe they should be fired, whoever's made this, and ranted for 15 minutes. And the next day we got permission to not make the site purple. It was great. She's a folk hero. Um, the outcomes after this, um, are you sending the right message? Um, because you want, it's like, I want, you know, these people to be drawn to this site. So am I sending the message that will draw them to this site? With our group, you can make things a little bit goofier and rounder and nicer. Like, we enjoy that. We're techie. We're a little weird. If you're looking for, you know, government officials, you don't want that. You want to look like Microsoft. You know, that's, that's kind of, you know, are you sending the right message? Can people guess what your content is intelligently? Like, without using a search box, can they say, yeah, I bet that article would be there under, under that you know, um, navigation bit? And is your design appall appealing or appalling? <laughs> Either one. You kind of want to know. <laughs> so now it's time to code. And a lot of people at this point think usability testing is over. Um, but it's not. You want to do small iterations, like so small. I mean, this is good for us as developers. This is a great thing to do. Um, but you want to have these small iterations so you can keep going to customers and saying, what do you think now? What do you think now? Um, so if you have a new idea, you know, instead of throwing it directly into the code base, mock it up first. That's what we're doing at my company. We're making these really nice mock-ups from Bootstrap that are clickable and you can play around with them so that we can put them in front of our customers or teachers. We can put them in front of teachers and say, does this make sense? Because it's very easy for us. We're used to where everything is, just doing it. And putting it in front of a teacher, we're watching to see where they get confused and where we might want to simplify the interface. 
um, and you know, get your users using as quickly as you can. Um, don't you don't do a fake beta like we do. Like, oh, it's beta, but I have like one million users. Do like a real beta with like 20 users who you will love and t and communicate with and be like the be their best friend for like a few months. So the outcomes, um, are you on the right track? And did your users have a better idea? Because you need to keep talking to them because sometimes they have a good idea. They're like, oh, that thing you have planned is like kind of cool, but I really wish you were just doing this. And you're like, oh, that would make so much more money. Yes, let's do that. So at this point, you're out of beta. You know, yay, we're done. You know, wait for the money to start rolling in or the fame or, you know, solve all the world's problems. Your job is not done. You're not done developing, more than likely, unless you've sold it. You know, so you are not done usability testing. You're probably going to get a lot of data like this. This is a heat map. They are very cool. They're awesome to look at. They're great to throw in front of, like, you know, managers. I love them. You know, you'll probably get Google Analytics. You are not done talking to your users. You need to interview your users again. Are there any pain points to our system? Don't try to guess because I swear, curse words do not show up on heat maps. I've checked. You know, when they start getting angry, you can't see that. You know, ask them what they would like and ask them, you know, how do you do this? Because there's nothing perverts your system like having a user in it. And they will use it in weird ways, and you don't want to fight them. You want them to have a great time, you know, dealing with, um, you know, doing stuff in your system. And if they're using it in a novel way, encourage that. Make it easier for them to do that. So outcomes. Do your users still want your product? Also a good thing to know. What should you drop? Sometimes you'll have a feature that nobody uses. You know what? Drop it. You know, if, it's, if you can do that painlessly, get rid of it. Stop, you know, don't have tech debt over that. What should you promote? Maybe there's a cool feature you think they would like if they just knew how to get to it. And so you need to push it more towards the top and push it in their face a little bit more. And is it time for a 2.0? Um, you know, is it time to do a revamp? You know, let's see. You know, are they done? You know, are they getting kind of bored with the site? Are they hoping for things that would really revamp it? You know, that can help you gauge. So I am the, an accessibility person. Um, and I, let me talk about accessibility for just a minute. No. OK. Um, Accessibility is usability for a group of users who have additional needs, so you can't forget about them. But that is its own talk. Like, literally, I've given that talk. I've given a 45-minute talk. I've done a four-hour tutorial on that. Um, it's a lot of information, because a lot of it is novel to all of you. So I'm just going to give you some uh, brief overviews. Um, don't do it at the end. Um, before you start a new thing, if you want to be accessible, you have to think about it from the beginning. So that means doing a little bit of reading. Um, I did write a book, so you can go read that. It's very small. But you know, also, the Penn State has a great accessibility website. Um, I've also done several talks. There's many of us that have done talks. Go watch a few of those. Um, kind of get an, an idea of who you'll be developing for. Um, and just one, you know, usually you know, people ask me about suites. I don't like suites. Um, accessibility suites, they tend to put up a lot of red herrings, and they waste a lot of your time, and they don't test for the things you need to be testing for. So I don't like suites. I think that it's better if you know how to develop for people who have accessibility needs. Um, how much more time do I have? Huh? OK. Um, at this point, actually, I'm ready for questions now. If you have a question, uh, line up at uh, the microphones in the audience. But in the meantime, let's give Katie a big round of applause. Uh, right, so uh, we'll start over here. Okay. Thank you for the talk. That's very helpful. But uh, I'm a little bit worried about one of the, your advices from the beginning, uh, to look at the competition before you start de designing your own product. Because I have an a fear, it's not really grounded, that that would uh, like put me on the track, put me in, in that, that group of people, and I would think in terms of how those applications work and not invent my own uh, way of, of solving this particular problem. Writers have that problem too. They're like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read anything because then I'll write like them, and that's not the case. Um, in general, we're putting words on web pages and we're making things move around. So if you take it down to the basics, we're not doing anything too insane. I recommend looking at the competition because if you don't, you're setting yourself up for failure. If you're worried, like 
don't look you know, deeply into one. If you're really worried about it, look at a ton of competition. Um, because I think even if you have that fear, trust me, when we found all our competitors, there was a moment of, oh, crap. The more we looked at them, the more confident we were in our product. They're like, we are doing this differently. We have a different tack, and we know how to sell it. Because if you try to sell it, and oh, good Lord, you know, we're in phase two funding. Are we selling our little buns off? Um, we now know how to sell it. And if you don't know what your competition is doing, you can't sell it, um, even to your customers. Because your customers will say, but I use, already use this. Why should I move to yours? So you really have to know and make a case for your application. And you know that's how you can differentiate yourself. I think that it's scary, but you will end up with a much stronger product as soon as you can be like, oh, they suck. And you'll feel better about yourself. OK, thank you. Great, uh, next question, please. So you mentioned uh, like dropping features that nobody uses, and I guess this kind of fits in with accessibility stuff too. Um, how do you how do you notice when you have things in your product that maybe not a lot of people use, but for the few who use them, they're vital? If they're vital to the few, yeah. then you keep it. But, if, but how do you how do you notice that? Like, you talk you to people. Uh, if you notice that it's, you'll probably see a set pattern. Like you might see it when you look at analytics. Uh, if you look through specific, what are specific users doing? Um, you know, as they're going through the site, like you notice a certain pattern that keeps popping out. Um, and for that, it may be that that vital feature for that few is simply those few have found it. So it may be something you want to promote. Um, when I'm talking about like things that nobody seems to use, you would see uneven use. It's like it gets pulled up like once every three months. You know, literally like you know half a percent of your users ever even looks at it. There's a lot of half completions, that kind of thing. When there doesn't seem to be a high engagement, if there's a high consistent but engagement, well, a high engagement with a low number of people, that is definitely something to look at because it's like maybe you just need to promote it better. That you know, the lucky few have found it. You need to share it with everybody. Thanks. All right, next question, please. How do you recruit people f for, um, for before design, before e when you get the idea? I mean, there's asking friends and family, but like you said, people are polite, especially friends and family. Yes. Um, I like user groups. Um, if you have, like, for instance, um, you want to make an app for um, people that are fans of football, mm -hmm. you know, join local user groups. Um, and get to be friends with these people and get to know like your local community. Um, join bulletin boards. Um, go down those rabbit holes where all the people are. Find the Reddit. You know, find those people. They're out there because everybody, there's like five million Reddits and you know, for everything, there's one about bras. You know, and it's very popular. It's like you will find your people. You'll find that tribe somewhere. But you do have to find them. Um, and usually, once you find, like, I recommend starting with big things like Reddit. And once you go from, like, Reddit, you can find the local stuff. And then you can find, like, the local meetup groups. And you do have to engage with the community. Um, but then you can find them. Um, but uh, yeah, recruit first and be friends first. Uh, so should in recruiting, should you focus on things that that would bring you face to face to people first and then sort of go go on to greater mm -hmm. sites and then to the uh, various uh, specialized sites? It depends on who you find first. Yes. Um, sometimes like, oh, Reddit people love to like, you know, respond. So that's a chatty group. Um, but sometimes you can find a really good local group that you just stumble upon. We're working with a local group of teachers that teaches foreign languages after school. And that gave us access to like 800 children and 30 teachers. Um, things you never knew were out there. You kind of make the rounds, and right. then you stumble on these people. So I recommend uh, the most valuable, valuable feedback I usually get is face to face. But you're probably going to do a lot of online hunting, too. OK. All right. Thank you. OK, so we have time for uh, the two people who are there and no more. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Um, could you please uh, tell us more, more practical uh, advices? So imagine you have a site, already not a better but uh, work in a uh, growing community, and uh, you want to collect more feedbacks. Uh, what would you suggest to, to use, uh, uh, I mean practically, uh, online chats, poll, uh, some questionnaires? Uh... Um, I like SurveyMonkey. I think SurveyMonkey, people, it's a nice interface. People are used to it. Um, definitely, if you use something like that, be very, like, look over those questions very, very carefully. If you can find a psych person to, like, look over them for you, 
do that. Um, you know, but you want you can use SurveyMonkey, you can you know use email. Um, I still prefer face to face because I think that's where you get the best feedback. You can do a survey for 500 people and get okay feedback, and we can get awesome feedback from five people face to face, and it actually ends up taking less time. Um, so that's one of the things. As for apps, they change so quickly. Like I started writing this talk, you know, months ago, and even in that time, new things popped up. Um, try different things, but for the most part, that's why I keep hitting the face-to-face, -face, talk to people, show people. A lot of it, like use Google Hangouts if you have to, and just do a face-to-face -face that way. And actually, Google Hangouts is nice because you can record it. But those are some of the things I would rec I would recommend. Okay, thank you. Hey, last question. Hi, um, I'm a. Uh, I'm in the kind of odd situation of having a fair amount of funding, but uh, not a very large user group. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing disease simulation, so it's important work, but uh, there's maybe 200 people worldwide. And so we have access to like five people, five users. So I've been concerned about uh, kind of diversity of opinions and also, but mainly just overexposing people mm -hmm. to after it's been explained once, then they don't have that reaction anymore. Do you have any thoughts to share about this kind of initial reaction versus yeah. the continuous feedback that you're discussing? I mean, both are valuable because they're growing with the site. But yeah, you definitely need to get like a new, just one new, I mean, you if it's such a small community, just get one new person in occasionally. Like, and even if you say, look, do you know anybody that I could just buy them a drink? you know, and get them to sit down and look at this for an hour. Um, we definitely have teachers that we haven't invited into our beta, so they're not allowed to use our thing. Um, they're just allowed to look at it every few months. So you might want to see if you can just, you know, find a way to, you know, get one of these people to give you an hour of their time every few months to give you a fresh set of eyes. Um, and with a small community, it might take you, you might eventually run into where you're going to basically, you know, be can be developing for this you know community and that happens um but you know you can also like follow like how long does it take somebody to complete a task if you're really worried that you're getting over complicated um but yeah i would definitely see if you can like just court a few people that you would not give access to but that you can just talk to every few months and show them what you've done since then thanks great well uh that's all the time we have so everybody please thank katie cunningham Okay, we'll be making another start at about uh, 12.10, so we'll see you then.